So I would like to hear argument on this witness before we hear the other witnesses. So, and Ms. Tianetti, I asked you the other day whether she reached out to you or you reached out to her and you said there was an intermediary, but my concern was whether she came out of nowhere and reached out about this case, and that seems to sort of... It wasn't Mr. Yanetti, it was me. Okay. All right, so... So the question I asked was answered pretty much by this witness, whether she saw something and decided she wanted to come forward. All right, uh, it's the Commonwealth's motion. What are you asking me to do? Again, I found a violation of Rule 14. And there are two concerns here, the, the competency of the witness's testimony, how much she can testify to, whether she should testify at all. Um, what is it you're asking me, Mr. Lally? Your Honor, I'm asking that the witness be excluded from testifying at the trial uh, for the violation of Rule 14, uh, specifically, I believe it's Rule 14A6. Um, this is a witness, as uh, the court um, picked up on, that uh, reached out, albeit through an intermediary, um, with reference to just sort of discovering or coming upon this case uh, in uh, several weeks into the trial. Um, it is concerning given the fact that uh, the witness represented that she um, had a subscription to the Globe Online, received word of this, and the first time that she had ever seen it or it had grabbed her attention uh, was in that first week of May when, um, as the court is well aware, there's been widespread media coverage, uh, particularly through the Boston Globe, for years at this point. Um, the limitations of the testimony. Um, it's also concerning because the disclosure from counsel uh, indicated, uh, again, as the court had noted, uh, I didn't want to get into too much as, as far as for purposes of this voir dire, but there was additional material that was indicated in the disclosure that the witness had reviewed, including the UC Davis uh, re related to the canine uh, DNA or the lack thereof, uh, as well as, um, <clears throat> forgive me, the um, dog bite history of that specific dog, which also I would note for the court includes photographs of what a dog bite from that specific dog looks like. Um, and that specifically apparently was uh, not provided uh, to this witness who's then opining on, uh, inferably at least, that uh, that dog was the cause of these particular injuries. Uh, however, was not shown uh, specifically anything to do with that bite history as far as by way of reports uh, or photographs. So that juxtaposed or coupled with uh, the immensely late disclosure. I mean, we're talking about uh, at least the sixth week of trial uh, by the time this witness is even mentioned, uh, not on the defendant's witness list, uh, not mentioned at any point in time during the pendency of the case, um, and then sort of pops up um, in the middle of May uh, and to the point that uh, the limited amount of material or information that's provided by counsel as far as disclosure opinion <clears throat> Uh, doesn't come until today. Um, so for, for all those reasons, Your Honor, the Commonwealth is requesting that uh, her testimony in its entirety be excluded from this trial. Jackson. Your Honor, exclusion is the highest form of punishment. It's the highest form of sanction that the court has available to it. Just to, to put a fine point on it, it is, a, it is a dire, dire remedy. And I know the court has mentioned two or three times I'm finding a violation of Rule 14. That sounds as if the court is suggesting or, or uh, has inferred that we did something wrong. We didn't do anything wrong. As the court learned, I, I didn't reach out to her. She reached out and said, hey, look, I've got some experience with this. I, I asked you that the other day, though, and you, I was told that you reached out to her through an intermediary. I wasn't told she reached out to you through an intermediary. No, that there's a difference. I mean, My, what I was trying to get at is this somebody who read about this case and said, you know, I want to be part of that. That's what I was trying to get at. I think it was pretty clear, Mr. Jackson. Go ahead, continue with your argument. Okay, okay I did not misrepresent anything to the court. I, I didn't say offense, that. I take offense at the court's tone that you're saying, yes, you did say that. You just said that. You okay. said, I just heard the testimony, and it, it's not what I said the other day. I know a person in Los Angeles DA's office. I received a text message from that person on, on this controversy concerning the dog bites. I then reached out to her. So when you asked me who reached out to whom, I reached out to her through an intermediary, my friend in the DA's office, 
back in Los Angeles County. I was Mrs. So maybe it wasn't clear what I was looking for. I think it was clear. But go ahead, okay. continue with your argument on this. My point is, Rule 14 requires a sanction if, in fact, the attorney has done something wrong. In other words, it, it, it connotes the idea that we're doing something by hi actively hiding evidence or holding back evidence or not providing evidence that you know you're going to use at some point in an effort to take a tactical advantage. And the, the sanction for that is exclusion. I've never met this woman. First time I, I laid eyes on her was during the process after she flew out here to, to engage this, this uh, right here process. She indicated I could potentially provide some information about this controversy concerning dog bites. I then sent her materials. I talked to her, I sent her materials. I found her to be incredibly credible. I found her to be experienced. And I found her to be uh, knowledgeable in this very specific area, which is rare. There's not that many people who have published, doctors who have published in the area of dog bites specifically. So I thought it makes sense for me to reach out to her and talk to her, which is exactly what we did. And within a couple of days, literally, you could almost count it by the hours of me receiving her information, we then had a discussion amongst ourselves. Is this somebody that we want to then uh, present on the defense side, on the defense case? And we turned the information over to Mr. Lally. Fault of ours. And I don't believe that the, the Commonwealth has made out a prejudice that they can't overcome. The, it's, it's late. Obviously, Mr. Lally is a skilled lawyer. Uh, there's nothing to say that he can't or hasn't been able to uh, prepare for the cross-examination uh, or for an exam and examination in front of the jury. And I just don't think exclusion is appropriate. Thanks. All right, so the, the, the second part of this argument, and I'll start with the Commonwealth first. So the, in your motion to exclude, you also raise uh, Darbert type concerns. So Mr. Lally, is there portions, if I permit her to testify, uh, are there portions, uh, focus specifically on the part of her opinion where she says, um, I guess the defense expects her to be able to say she will testify that these injuries are inconsistent with having been struck by a vehicle, road rash, or scratches from broken glass or taillight material. Um, I think you have an uphill battle on that part, Mr. Jackson. But <laughs> Commonwealth, what are you saying? If she, if she testifies, what should she be able to testify to? And, and don't just say nothing. I, I want some input. No, no. If, if the court were permitted to test uh, the doctor to testify, Your Honor, uh, what I would submit would be permissible testimony uh, from a legal standpoint um, as some factual questions uh, in regard to that. But from a legal standpoint, uh, I, I think uh, the court could permit her to testify as to the injuries uh, that she observed, um, her uh, work in history uh, in that area, observing um, prior injuries uh, related to animal attacks and, and whatever consistency she believes uh, that they have with that. Um, I do not think it would be proper to allow this witness to testify or opine anything about um, the inconsistency uh, with regard to uh, pedestrian injuries. Um, I, I don't think any proper foundation has been laid for there, uh, whether it be through experiential uh, knowledge in relation to that or uh, any sort of, you know, specialized training or knowledge or um, anything to do with that. Uh, anything from a forensic pathology or anatomical pathology perspective, I think should also be out of bounds and excluded with regard to this witness. Uh, she's certainly a very experienced emergency room physician. Uh, so anything in relation to that, um, I think it's permissible, but as far as the you know ex experience when it comes to motor vehicle crashes or pedestrian crashes, of which the court is well aware, there are a litany of different types of, of interactions a pedestrian can have uh, with a motor vehicle in a collision sequence. Um, and simply saying, well, there was no injuries to the leg, so it couldn't uh, have been an, a, a motor vehicle collision is just just plain wrong, um, and and not backed up by science or anything else uh, uh, that that this witness uh, can testify to from the very limited experience she has uh, in that realm. So if the witness were able uh, or uh, permitted by the court to testify, uh, I would submit that uh, her testimony should be relegated to simply um, 
what, if any, opinions, uh, her experience, obviously, and then what, if any, opinions she uh, draws with regard to the uh, causation of the injuries on the right arm, um, you know, as it pertains to uh, consistency there. But I, I venture to guess that it's, it's likely that those are probably also uh, going to be, in her opinion, consistent with many other causes uh, beyond that, um, if she's being reasonable. All right, Mr. Jackson. <clears throat> I'll submit, Your Honor. I, I, I have no issue with, I just said I'll submit, I'm not submitting. Um, I have no issue with limiting her testimony to the, to the animal attack issue, the dog attack issue. I, I didn't, as the court noted, I didn't spend any time, I think I may have asked one question that's consistent with the motor vehicle incident. Um, I have no problem if the court wants to limit her testimony to the dog bite uh, aspect and not the motor vehicle aspect. I wasn't planning on going into that aspect anyway. I've got another pathologist who's going to do exactly that. But you did go through it with her, and it, it's on your disclosure. It, it is, but I have no problem editing. <sighs> so why is it on the, the disclosure, or what the Commonwealth turned over, that she viewed all reports associated with Chloe's bite history in the UC did? I assume that she reviewed it. She must not have seen it, or, or opened it, or reviewed it. I, I, I didn't know. But that's what I was saying, too. Everything that's in the disclosure is what if she's permitted to testify, you, you led her through quite a bit today, you won't be able to. I mean, you, you, she struggled with to what degree of certainty she held an opinion. She struggled to what she viewed. Uh, she didn't write a report. I have to consider all of these things too uh, as the gatekeeper as to whether she can actually assist the jury. So I'm not deciding this right here. Ms. Delally, if I do permit her to testify, I will give you time um, to absorb this testimony and to find an expert in rebuttal for this. How, how long might something like that take? Um, not terribly long. Um, as, as far as preparation, uh, um, I, I can't give an exact time frame on that as far as a rebuttal witness. Um, I'd say a week at the most. A week from today? Yes. Why don't you start looking at least? All right, well, I decide I won't know until Thursday. Sure. All right. All right, anything else on this witness? All right, next witness, please. With regard to...